This is scary, but it is not hard. You know how to do all of these things. And so if you can get past the fact that it feels scary because this is a very tiny baby and you haven't ever seen a baby this small before, you know how to do these things. You know how to ventilate. You know how to do chest compressions. You know how to keep this baby warm. So it is not actually hard. Here you on eight. Here you on eight. Okay, you're clear. Stand by for your base. Welcome to EMS Cast, where we provide high-level education for you, the providers on the streets. Today, we have Dr. Avery McKenzie joining us to talk about an incredibly stressful topic in neonatal resuscitation. Dr. McKenzie is an ER physician in Southwest Colorado. She's also the regional medical director for the Western RETAC, as well as medical director for a few other agencies down in that area. She is a rural doc who had her own experiences with feeling some fair amount of nerves around neonatal resuscitation. So she decided that she was going to tackle this topic so that she could conquer her fears and essentially feel more comfortable with it herself, which is amazing. And I wanted her to come on the show and help us do the same. So Avery, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm psyched to be here. And as always, we have with us my co-host, Will Berry. Hello, everybody. Great to be back. So Avery, talk to us about this. This is, like I said, very nerve wracking. And talk to us about your experience with it and why you decided to do this and why this is important. Yeah, well, like you said, I am a provider in a very rural emergency department. And specifically, I'm a nocturnist, which means that very commonly, I'm the only doctor in the hospital. And invariably, scary things seem to happen in the middle of the night when you're there by yourself. And so as I was leaving residency to come out and practice at this hospital, I identified neonatal resuscitation as the single most scary thing to me. And so I leaned into this and decided that this was going to be an area of personal interest for me. And so I gave a lecture at the end of my residency on it. And I've continued to try and stay up to date on neonatal resuscitation so I can feel most comfortable when I am most scared. So that is how I got interested in doing it. And since I've been out here, I've had several opportunities to practice. And most recently, I actually had experience with a pre-hospital outborn delivery. Is that something you would like to talk about? Oh, absolutely. That's perfect. My interest is peaked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Set us up with this case. So I am on the night shift. I am single coverage at this point, And I get a little heads up from the helicopter EMS service that, oh, we got asked to stage for a potential imminent delivery, but it sounds like perhaps it was too imminent and the EMS crew has already delivered and we haven't heard anything more. How does that make you feel? I'm yeah, nervous. Blood pressure's up. <laughs> yeah. And some additional information. This is a very preterm delivery. So 30 weeks. Wow. Oh my gosh. Okay. It's a snowstorm. <laughs> of course. And the EMS service in the best of conditions is an hour and 10 minutes away from the hospital. And in the worst of conditions, much worse than that. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm going to go use the restroom for a second. So that is what I heard. And I hadn't heard from any actual on the ground providers, but I had legitimately just given a lecture on neonatal resuscitation at the state emergency medicine ASEP conference just two weeks earlier. And I was actually psyched. I was like, ah, <laughs> I am at the top of my game with this right now. And I was like, yes, this is excellent. They know what to do and I can help them do it. So I got a call from the actual paramedics on scene who said, we have just delivered and the baby is doing great. And I was like, oh, I'm going to need a little bit more information. <laughs> <laughs> so what I heard was this was a G5P3 approximately at 
30 weeks who had had preterm labor and so had actually spent a week in the hospital and had gotten two doses of steroids, which I identified to be a good thing, but had then left the hospital to go home. And after being at home for several days, had this evening noted that she had been having contractions, called the ambulance. And as the ambulance arrived, she delivered a 30-week infant. Real quick, before we get on to what we do with this now tiny little human being, you briefly mentioned steroids. Why is that important that she got that? So steroids are helpful for lung development and are given to women in preterm labor to help basically with the baby's production of as I understand, kind of surfactant in the lungs so that they're able to better ventilate their lungs if they're born very prematurely. Okay. So now they have delivered and they're met a while away from the hospital. Well, I have a question. Yeah. Was the EMS crew in the field calling you just to notify or were they seeking any sort of guidance? So both. Okay. He needed a little bit of guidance. So yes, he was calling for both a heads up that they were coming and some guidance going forward. And was the guidance around any sort of resuscitation or was the baby, you know, doing pretty well at that point? Yes. So he had very aggressively resuscitated this baby already. And so I will tell you about that. And the baby was doing shockingly okay. But there were like a couple of points that I think he needed to think about. So if I'm the paramedic in the field with this delivery, as the baby is delivering, let's say the the actual delivery goes well. And we just talked about some of that with Dr. Moriera. But how do I know if the baby needs resuscitation? Okay, that's a great question. And that has a very easy answer. And so you just basically have to ask yourself three questions. Is this a term gestation? So is this baby 37 weeks or greater? Yes or no. Does this baby have good tone, meaning like, Are they contracting their muscles versus are they floppy? And are they making respiratory effort in the form of breathing or crying? And if the answer to all three of those questions is yes, this is a term gestation, they have good tone and they're breathing, then you don't have to do anything. You do not have to resuscitate that baby. You clean the goop off of them. You give them to their mother. You say congratulations. You don't have to do anything more. But if the answer to any one of those three questions is no, then you have to begin resuscitation. Let's start with the first one. Let's say it's not a term baby, but tone looks good. Respirations look good. What do you do? you're still going to take that baby and begin resuscitation. Just because it's a much more high-risk situation, they haven't had time for their lungs to develop the same. And so that is a baby that you're going to begin resuscitation on. And so the first step in the resuscitation is actually very easy, is just warming, drying, stimulating, positioning the airway, kind of general, very easy things that you do. So you're going to take towels, you're going to rub the baby off on the back, you're going to basically just encourage this baby to get angry or irritated to the point that it starts breathing and crying. So the first step of neonatal resuscitation is very easy. You're just going to warm them, dry them, stimulate them, try to make them cry and breathe. And at that point in time, you're then going to assess what their respiratory effort is. So are they gasping or have apnea? And is their heart rate now greater than 100? And even if that baby is preterm, if they are making good respiratory effort and their heart rate is appropriate, you actually can stop the resuscitation at that point. You do not need to go further down the algorithm as long as they have an appropriate heart rate response. So something that I want to plug for the paramedics in the field is 
if you have the opportunity to prepare for this moment, many times we do not. But if we do, a lot of systems carry some sort of warming device, like a think hand warmer for your gloves in the winter, but a lot bigger. And that device needs some time to do its reaction that causes it to get warm. So if I knew this was coming, I like to prep that device by opening it, starting it, letting it warm. And then what I like to do is lay out several blankets on top of it so they can try to warm. And then we have like a landing space for the baby. And then as the we dry the baby, we use up a towel or blanket and we throw it to the side. Then we use up another one and we throw it to the side. And if we don't have a warming device, or even if we do, the best way we can facilitate warmth in the child is to get them dry and remove all the moisture from them. And that's usually pretty easy to do in Colorado, pretty dry out here, but <laughs> exactly warming the space. So warming up those blankets from underneath doing everything you can to make the back of the ambulance as warm as possible and using your other tools like hat for the baby and using lots of blankets. If you ever go to a neonatal resuscitation, you'll see they use a really large volume of blankets. So let's say baby comes out and there's a problem with tone or cry term or not. Does it make a difference in that situation if there's a problem with tone or cry, whether it's term or not? No. So if you answer no to one of the three questions, you feed into the same pathway. You're going to resuscitate this baby and it doesn't matter which of the questions you answer no to. It's all the same. It all feeds into this first step of the pathway, which is just warm, dry, stimulate, position the airway. It's all the same. It doesn't matter how you got there. You just have to do that first step the same way every time. Well, that's great. Okay. So we've done that first step. We've taken and we've answered no to term, tone, or cry. We've started a resuscitation, dried them. And you said, if everything looks good, they're now moving, normal respirations, normal heart rates, we're done. What happens if there's a problem with any of those? So one of the other really important things to think about here is the way that you are going to assess how your resuscitation is going is by following the heart rate. So the heart rate is the most important vital sign in terms of telling you how your resuscitation is going and how you move on to the next step. So when I was first thinking about this, the way that made the most sense to me is that for months, this baby has had an opportunity to practice their heart beating. They've been getting Dopplers at the OBGYN. They've had ultrasounds. We know that this heart is working, but this is the very first moment that they've had any opportunity to practice with their lungs. So they're going from a situation where there is no ventilation of the lungs to this is their first opportunity to ventilate the lungs. And so your job is to get those lungs going and you're going to figure out how good of a job you're doing by following the heart rate. So really the heart rate is what's guiding the resuscitation. So after you've done your first 30 seconds of resuscitation, which was just the stimulation. Now we're going to look at the heart rate. And so the goal is to have a heart rate that is over 100. If it's over 100, great. You get kicked out of the algorithm and now you're in just post resuscitation care, which is supporting the baby. But if your heart rate is under 100, you're going to need to continue resuscitation. And so the next 30 seconds of resuscitation are all about getting those lungs to work. And so that involves positive pressure ventilations. So if the heart rate is our most important trend or marker, would you say then ventilations is our most important treatment? Exactly. I think that is a very appropriate way to think about it. So how do we approach this and what's our trigger for providing positive pressure ventilation? So the trigger is very simply, is the heart rate less than 100? And is the baby apneic or gasping? If either of those two things is present, then you're going to start positive pressure ventilation. And we're good at this. You guys are good at this. We use bag valve mask very frequently. Here, it's a little bit faster than in adults. So you're going to be ventilating the baby at a rate of 40 to 60 breaths a minute. So squeeze, release, 
two, three, squeeze, two, three, squeeze, two, three, you're going to be ventilating them at a rate about one a second. And so that is much faster than most you're used to. But otherwise, it is it is very similar to any other bag valve mask you would be doing. One other plug I, I want to give, the neonatal resuscitation program guideline is actually to get the patient on the pulse oximeter really fast. And part of that is because it gives you real-time feedback of the patient's heart rate. And so if you were trying to do this alone in the back of an ambulance where maybe you only have one cardiac monitor and you have essentially two patients, mom and baby, this may be a time where you definitely prioritize using that for the baby because you need that real-time feedback of the heart rate. It can change so quickly and it can change so dramatically with your ventilations that you need something giving you that instant feedback, whether it's the four lead monitor or the pulse ox or both. Yeah, uh, well, that is a very astute observation. They have actually moved the monitoring much up the algorithm. So NRP versions earlier, so we're on version eight now, back in five and six, they had much less monitoring done of the baby heart rate and oxygen saturations. And here they've really moved the use of the monitor up to kind of step two. You should be putting the pulse ox on now and the cardiac monitor also to give you that very directed feedback. I have a question. If you're there, you have this baby in front of you, and maybe you're in the emergency department, your team is working to get the equipment ready. What is a good go-to way to, to get a heart rate? Do you find that you like to auscultate or palpate an umbilical heart rate? How do, how do you like to do that to get a quick assessment? Both of those are very appropriate ways to look for this. I would say that I would preferentially use a stethoscope and listen to the heart rate. But if you feel comfortable palpating the umbilical stump and feeling for a pulse there, that's totally reasonable. I think both are much better options than trying to feel like a brachial artery or something at this point. I think go for the big spots, the big vessels. Continuing down our algorithm, we have a baby who's come out. We have a problem with term, tone, or cry. We dry, we stimulated, then we checked our heart rate. Our heart rate was less than 100, so we started our positive pressure ventilations at, you said, one in a second? Yeah, 40 to 60 a minute. 40 to 60 a minute, so almost one every second. And then if with those ventilations, our heart rate improves over 100, what do we do? That's great. You have succeeded. Then you're perfect. Hooray! <laughs> Hand shaking. Exactly. You're going to then move to post resuscitation care. You're going to see is this baby having persistent labored breathing? Are they cyanotic? Are they working hard? And if that's the case, then you'll kind of do your normal maneuvers like provide oxygen, provide CPAP if they need a little bit of extra support keep them warm, keep them dry, put them with mom, but they get kicked out of the algorithm into kind of just post-resuscitative care. You have made sure that their lungs are able to work and you're going to continue to support them, but they don't need aggressive other interventions to continue their lungs working. In the pre-hospital setting, are we worried about like oxygen targets? How much oxygen are we giving these babies right off the bat? Yeah. So for full term babies, you're going to be resuscitating them with room air, which seems kind of sacrilege to think about like, oh, my gosh, this is a neonate in distress. Why would I be resuscitating them with room air? But we know that kids actually do better to get their initial resuscitation with room air if they are preterm specifically 34 weeks or less, you're going to resuscitate them with a little bit higher percentage oxygen, 30%. But very honestly, that's probably not your main area of concern at this moment. I would say resuscitate them with what you've got and the positive pressure is, is the most important thing at this point. But yes, at this point in time in the algorithm, you don't need to be doing supplemental oxygen for most neonates. So let's continue down the algorithm. 
Okay. Heart rate didn't improve over 100 with positive pressure ventilations. Then what do we do next? So this next 30 second chunk is all about improving your ventilation. So making sure that you are adequately ventilating the child. And so the NRP algorithm does talk about a mnemonic that can be helpful for you to think about the things you can do to better ventilate the kids. So the mnemonic is Mr. Sopa. So the M is adjusting the mask to make sure that you've got a good seal on the face. The R is repositioning the airway, making sure that you've got the baby in a good sniffing position. S is for suctioning the mouth and the nose if there are secretions. O is about opening the mouth and doing a little bit of a jaw thrust. P is increasing the pressure. I didn't necessarily talk about the peak inspiratory pressure and PEEP that you should be using when you're initially starting your positive pressure ventilation, but generally you don't want to give too much pressure to the lungs because newborn's lungs are quite sensitive to barotrauma. And so generally when you're starting this, you really only require 15 to 20 centimeters of water in terms of compliance when you're using the bag. But if you have not been able to ventilate at those inspiratory pressures, you can go up on this kind of as high as 30 centimeters of water for a peak inspiratory pressure with a full-term infant. And it's a little bit less with a preterm infant. But you at this point can make that choice in order to try and ventilate. And then the A is consideration of an airway alternative like an LMA or intubation. And those, will those peak pressures, that's not going to be something we have on our standard BBM, right? Those are anesthesia bags? Correct. So yeah, it would be on an anesthesia bag or on a Neopuff, which is what we would use in the emergency department. Yeah, where where I currently work, our bag valve mask does have the ability to adjust our PEEP. We are not going to be altering peak inspiratory pressures unless the patient is on the ventilator. Now, that being said, we have a neonatal transport team that does bring a Neopuff and all of those specialty tools to the patient, which if you do work in a rural context where a team like that is available, that's just one of the many amazing advantages they can bring to a situation like this is that type of specialty equipment. So next 30 second chunk, we try the Mr. Sopa mnemonic in an attempt to improve our ventilations. If that works, heart rate goes above 100. Great. Balloons drop again. We're happy. But if that fails, then what? So then you either go one of two places. So if your heart rate remains between 160, you just kind of continue in this feedback loop of just keep trying everything you can do to ventilate better. So you will just keep trying your best to ventilate the baby. And very honestly, you probably won't get stuck here for that long because either you will do a good job, their heart rate will respond and you will get kicked out of the algorithm that way, or you will do a bad job or an inadequate job and their heart rate will drop. Because if you're not adequately ventilating and oxygenating the baby, this is how they will respond. So they will start becoming more bradycardic. And so if the heart rate drops below 60, now you go to more invasive resuscitation. So this is the point in which we start doing everything for them. So not just breathing, but also providing chest compressions so that we are also providing them cardiac output. You move now to 100% oxygen for the resuscitation and you work on getting access so that you can then go down the pathway of having to give epinephrine to have this be a full cardiac arrest resuscitation. 
And let's talk about that. How are you going to get access in this newborn? That's a great question, because in the emergency department, I would say this is the point in time where you would get an umbilical venous catheter. And that is the best access that you can get in this neonate. In the EMS setting, I, I mean, I would say that an IO would be the most appropriate thing to do at this time and that it would probably be like a distal femur IO. But I'm actually not sure if there's literature to suggest that something is better than something else. Do you guys have any sense? I know that, you know, NRP definitely endorses the the umbilical vein catheter. I think practically speaking, what a lot of EMS providers in the field are going to turn to initially is an IO. I think that that's been emphasized heavily for them, that it's going to be easier to find your landmarks. It's going to be easier to get access than searching for For an IV. Correct. Well, can you talk us through that in this like tiniest of tiny human beings who is just born? How are you going to get IO access on that patient? I'm going to have someone else do it. <laughs> Good yeah, call. Uh, yeah. You're in charge delegating. Someone else has got to figure it out. One plug I will give is if you're using the Easy IO brand of products, which is, I think, pretty ubiquitous, but there's multiple kinds out there, this would definitely be a time to reach for that pink needle, the smallest one. Remember that the the pink, the blue, and the yellow are kind of the most common size IO needles you see for the Easy IO. And really, they're the same gauge, but the length is the difference between the three needles. And the pink one is for patients this size. And the reason I bring this up, a lot of people say the pink needle is the pediatric needle, but it's actually for very small children. And remember that length is important because their marrow space is so small, you can enter the marrow space and continue right through and actually end up in the bone on the other side of the marrow space, which means your IO is not going to be functioning properly. So the other, only other plug I would say is, as I was taught, like with a carpentry drill, like let the tool do the work. And what that means is if it's spinning, give it time. It, it's going to do its job and make the hole through the bone into the marrow space. If you're pressing hard, you're most likely going to cause trauma to the patient and the bone and create a bigger problem. So just a little bit of patience doing this procedure goes a long way because their bones are soft and brittle enough and that needle is sharp enough. If you give it enough revolutions with the drill, it's going to do what it's supposed to do. Will any other tips for assuring that you end up at that correct length in the marrow and not too far? Well, I think if you've done IOs on adult patients, you're used to a like kind of a tactile simulation where you do have that all of a sudden there's kind of a release and resistance and you've entered the marrow space. Just remember, it's not going to be as profound with a child. Their bones are a lot smaller and they're not as hard. I, I guess, no, I don't have any practical tips other than to be gentle and as soon as you feel that pop through the bone, stop. Don't go any further. Yeah, and I even hesitate to use the word pop because it's not as profound. It's just a really subtle release and, and resistance. Some of our pediatric colleagues I know will, in these circumstances, not actually even use the drill. Just take the needle and kind of hand turn it in there so they can actually very tactile have that sensation and not go too far. So that might be something that you practice before the day that you're doing this for the first time. But from some of the experts that I've talked to about this and worked with, they've actually said, don't use the drill in this situation, just use your hand. Interesting. That's a great tip. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So on our algorithm, if the heart rate is less than 60, it's all hands on deck, full force ahead, chest compressions, access, epi, continue with good quality ventilations. Most importantly, what about advanced airway? 
Well, before we get to advanced airway, the thing that I think is important to remember is that you do want to be doing coordinated chest compressions and ventilations. And this ratio is different than adults. This ratio is different than PALS ratio because of the very extreme importance on ventilation. So the ratio is three compressions to one ventilation. So three to one, squeeze, 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 breathe. And so you're going to be doing it at the same kind of compression rate that you would do as an adult. So a hundred a minute. So the compression rate is the same, but it's the ratio of compressions to ventilations that is different with a heavy emphasis on ventilations. And even after you've placed an advanced airway, if you have placed an advanced airway, you're going to still do the ratio of compressions. You're not going to move to continuous compressions with ventilations. You're going to continue doing that based on that extreme importance of ventilation. Advanced airways. This is probably different based on the system in which you practice. I am a medical director in Western Colorado, and my crews utilize the Denver Metro director's protocols. And these protocols have very much de-emphasized and removed pre-hospital pediatric intubations from almost every single algorithm. So we are not recommending that pre-hospital providers who get this far in the algorithm intubate. That is not in the protocols anymore. And therefore, we are just focusing on high quality BVM. And I don't know what other systems across the country are recommending. Will, do you have pediatric or neonatal intubation in your protocols? So in my the 911 service that I work for part-time, we are very much in line with what you described. It has been de-emphasized and we utilize a supraglottic airway if we need to. In the critical care transport service that I work for, we are equipped and able to intubate these patients, but I would emphasize heavily that it's a different context, and that would be something that we would do if we were to travel to maybe a rural facility and we were there specifically to take the patient back to like the NICU at a tertiary care facility. And we have a lot of equipment. We have, you know, video laryngoscopes and all the appropriate monitoring. And so, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with that other than. We have a lot more tools at our disposal. I would feel way more comfortable doing that in that context than and in a pre-hospital context. As you described in your case, I would definitely think more along the lines of a supraglottic airway and also strictly because of the prioritization of tasks. If you don't have a lot of help in the field, we need to keep our mind back on the, your primary pearl that you gave us, which is we need to adequately ventilate the patient. Yeah. I mean, that's their lifeline, right? The oxygen, the ventilation is their lifeline. And if you pause that for any extended period of time, struggling with an airway, it could be, you know, sorry to say deadly. And so Will, what you described even on your crit care service is you're doing it like in a hospital with 20 hands around you to help medications, good lighting, adequate bed height, advanced tools, like intubating in the pre-hospital setting is challenging to begin with. And I, I do believe in advanced airway management in the pre-hospital setting, but this is one of the circumstances where I do believe it definitely should be de-emphasized because it's challenging to begin with. Then you add a tiny kid and a tiny airway that makes it more challenging. And then you add the fact that you may have one of these airways in your entire career to do. So you're not going to have a lot of experience with it either. I think that there's so much room for harm there when we know that BVM works and that these kids absolutely need ventilations and don't need a pause in those ventilations. 
So one advanced airway that you might consider in the pre-hospital setting when you're this far down the algorithm is an eye gel for infants that are 34 weeks or greater. NRP suggests that the smallest size of eye gel will work for those kids. For the super premature babies, less than 34 weeks, unlikely that any type of eye gel will appropriately size to set well over their larynx. So then just continue BBM at that point. Exactly. So I would like to go back to your case. So when you started the case, you were preparing for this potential resuscitation to be dropped off in your emergency department. Then you get a call saying the child was delivered in the field and is, to your knowledge, doing pretty well. What did you do next? How long was their transport? Did you still prepare? What was your mindset as you knew they were coming to you? So I received a telephone call from the paramedic who was amazingly calm and collected on this telephone call as he had now done one of the scariest things that I could imagine. But basically what he explained to me was that as the patient got out into the ambulance, she had what best could be described as a somewhat explosive delivery. He was able to deliver the baby and the placenta kind of all at once. And initially, the baby was making no respiratory effort, and so he began resuscitation. And so 30 seconds of kind of drying and stimulating didn't do anything, and so he moved on to ventilating the baby and so provided positive pressure ventilations, did everything he could to maximize the ventilations that he was providing, and ultimately the heart rate was still less than 60, and so he moved on to compressions. And so they did coordinated ventilation and compressions for several minutes they were not able to get an IO or IV in thinking about giving epinephrine. And so we're considering giving epinephrine through the endotracheal tube, which is an option while you're working on IV access. But luckily and amazingly and happily, the heart rate responded very well to a combination of ventilations and compressions. And after, I believe, two minutes of CPR, the heart rate was up over 100, and they did not have to give any epinephrine. And he then checked the oxygen saturations and there was some increased work of breathing, which is not surprising as this is a 30-weeker. But at this point, they moved kind of to post-resuscitative care, which is all about helping support that breathing, keeping the baby warm, and getting them to more definitive care with a NICU. So at that point in time, they began transporting to me. And so I was in contact with them over their hour and 20 minute transport, probably about every 10 minutes, we checked in to talk about how the oxygenation was going, how the work of breathing was going and how he was doing keeping the baby warm, because that was a very important thing on this very snowy cold night in Colorado with an hour and a half long transport of a baby who should have still been in utero for 10 more weeks, nice and cozy in that soup, like how they're doing now thrust out into the cold environment. But they did an amazing job of keeping the baby warm. So right up against mom, piled with all the warm blankets and keeping the back of the ambulance very warm. The baby was on the monitor and the pulse ox and by 10 minutes, had very appropriate oxygen saturations, really just on room air. And then the respiratory effort, so there was 
some belly breathing and retractions. And they did not necessarily have the supplies in order to provide CPAP to a baby of that size. But when ultimately the child got to the emergency department, we were able to provide the baby with CPAP. And when they got here, they got an umbilical venous catheter and was able to get antibiotics and infusion of sugar. And the NICU team came and picked them up and took them to the tertiary care center where they will be admitted for probably seven weeks until they're at gestational, appropriate term gestational age is how long most of them ultimately stay for. Talk to me about why in the hospital you gave antibiotics and sugar. We gave sugar because ultimately the baby sugar was 38 when they arrived at the emergency department. And if we want them to be able to make ATP to run all of their systems, we would like to provide them with some external sources of sugar so that they can make energy. Normal blood sugars in the first 48 hours of life are greater than... 50, and so it would be important that you maintain levels higher than that. Not grossly higher than that, but enough so that the baby can um, make energy to do the things they need to do. With the antibiotics, the concern really is why did this mom have such a preterm delivery? And was there some degree of chorioamnitis? And that would predispose the baby to bacteremia or sepsis. And so just proactively, the neonatologists recommend basically covering all of these babies for potential sepsis and bacteremia. If the sugar is less than 50 and we're going to treat with dextrose, what's going to be our dose? So if you have IV access at this point, you're going to give a bolus of two cc's per kg of D10W. Perfect. Any indication for fluids? So there is kind of mixed data on this, but if you have a baby that is requiring kind of prolonged or persistent resuscitation, NRP suggests that you should at least consider giving them like a 10 cc per kilo bolus of fluids and as a volume expander. Okay. What about in this situation where we may consider not starting resuscitation due to viability concerns or when we might consider terminating resuscitation because we're not seeing much progress? Yeah, so this is certainly a very fraught area of conversation and um, not a huge amount of personal experience with this, but the limits of viability, meaning the age at which a baby could potentially be resuscitated and go on to live is somewhere between 22 and 24 weeks. And so anything over 24 weeks of gestational age, this is a baby that kind of without question should receive resuscitation. If you have a baby that is known to be less than 22 weeks, so the mother says, I'm 19 weeks into this pregnancy and she is actively delivering or about to deliver, that is a baby that no amount of extra utero resuscitation will save. And so that would be a situation in which you would likely not resuscitate the baby, not do any type of resuscitation. But kind of in that window, the gray area of 20 to 24 weeks, those are infants that you should consider starting resuscitation. So going down the pathway with ventilations and compressions. But if you are having no response of the heart rate between 20 to 30 minutes of resuscitation, that's the point in time in which it is very reasonable in discussion with the family to stop a resuscitation because it's unlikely that any additional maneuvers are going to get this baby breathing and, and save their life. 
And by no responsive heart rate, you mean essentially asystole, no fetal heart asystole. rate despite Correct. 20 to 30 minutes of resuscitation. One thing I know that can be done in the pre-hospital context is actually putting the neonate inside of a almost like a plastic swaddle. I mean, in essence, it's a plastic bag. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. And we're not talking about their entire body. Their head is out, but almost like a plastic blanket. Can you speak to that at all? I will let you know in the setting of the case that we were discussing, this 30-week infant, we did put the baby in plastic wrap. It is something that they recommend with preterm babies somewhere less than 34 weeks. They do this as an additional way to keep them warm just because they they have such underdeveloped skin at this point. This is just another kind of layer of, of warmth to hold everything in prevent that heat loss. Great. Thanks so much for this, Avery. Can you take us home, wrap it up, tell us if we remember nothing else, what do we need to remember and then summarize that algorithm one more time? Totally. So I would say that if you want to remember one thing from this lecture, it is that this is scary, but it is not hard. You know how to do all of these things. And so if you can get past the fact that it feels scary because this is a very tiny baby and you haven't ever seen a baby this small before, you know how to do these things. You know how to ventilate. You know how to do chest compressions. You know how to keep this baby warm. So it is not actually hard. The algorithm itself is quite easy. The first part is just stimulating, warming, drying, 30 seconds of trying to piss them off into breathing. Then the next 30 seconds, you are going to breathe for them. You're going to provide positive pressure. You're going to ventilate their lungs. You're going to then trend their heart rate. So if their heart rate is over 100, fantastic. If it's not over 100, you are going to continue to try and correct your ventilations with all the strategies that you already know. And if if at that point in time their heart rate is dropping or it gets below 60, that's the point in which you would start chest compressions and medications and advanced airways as needed. So these are things you know how to do. And if you just review it in your mind, occasionally it will perhaps feel less scary when this ultimately happens. Thank you so much. This is also a good opportunity, I think, to plug this is such a low frequency thing um for anybody in emergency medicine that th there is no shame this is uh definitely the time to have a reference whatever that reference is for you that's great if you're the type of person that carries with you some some cards or an app on your phone like pd stat or your system provides you with one like a booklet of some kind Whatever that reference is for you, know that reference, know how to use it. You don't want to be fumbling through, well, where is the, the size BVM or where is the estimated birth weight or where is the epi dose? So routinely pull that reference out, go through it, practice with the reference. It alone is a tool that needs to be practiced with. And then also practice with your gear, know where your tiny baby stuff is, whether it's a BBM or a warmer or suction, know where that gear is, how it's used, and know how to draw up the appropriate size doses and medication for these kids. Because that alone, again, is a skill. And when you're in the heat of the moment in this scary situation, you're not going to just all of a sudden learn how to do this. You need to have practiced it. This was phenomenal, Avery. Thank you so much for this. I am going to go change my underwear, but I am feeling much more comfortable after this talk with you, and I hope our listeners are as well. Thank you guys so much for having me. This was very fun.